So I will show you two things, uh, how Atomic works. So Atomic is, is the, the, the tool that I'm, I'm presenting, um, how it works with um, demographics and how it works with uh, data queries for opening chart data, uh, mixing that with uh, SNOMED CT expressions. Yeah, so I'm, I'm Pablo, I'm from Uruguay. I've been working with OpenHR for the last 17 years, first as a Java developer, then as an architect, and also as an integration um, engineer. And I created some tools uh, that implement OpenHR along these years. Uh, Atomic is one of them. So the idea for the presentation is to have a quick view of what Atomic is and what it does. Um, a little bit of the data that I loaded in Atomic for doing the presentation. And, and then the three topics uh, that uh, you asked about, that is demographic support, uh, OpenHR data queries with SNOMED, and a little bit of um, OpenHR conformance verification. We will leave the questions for the end, uh, but you can write the questions on the chat, so I will go through them um, when I finish the presentation and demonstration. So Atomic um, is a, a clinical data storage and a demographic data storage. Implements both models of the OpenHR uh, specifications and has all the versioning inside. So that is every data that is created in Atomic is versioned. That, is, um, that creates a contribution, creates uh, version information and creates all the audit logs. This is part of the OpenHR uh, model. Uh, also does data validation based on operational templates. So everything that you, you store in Atomic should have a template that describes that information. Uh, even if it's demographic, it needs a, a template. And that template is just a big archetype in, in OpenHR. Yeah. We have a web console, I will show you that. And the web console has also a query builder. A query builder is just a component that helps you build queries to extract data. And the idea is to, to make that query builder um, as easy as possible. So you can you don't need to know programming to actually create queries and get information out of Atomic. It's just point and click. And one characteristic of Atomic is that we can change the database. Uh, we use MySQL for most things and for testing and, and, and basic setup, but you can switch to any relational database. Uh, that has a Java connector. So um, technically, uh, you are not bound to the database we propose. We saw many uh, solutions that are are just um, depending on one specific database because they use uh, features specific from that database. But we don't. So and and we have a like a layer there that is uh, very abstract, and we can switch. So if you use Postgres, for instance, you can use Atomic with Postgres or or, C or SQL Server or Oracle or whatever. Yeah, and we focus on on conformance. I will show you that um, a little later in the presentation. Uh, the data setup, we have two sets of data loaded in the system, just to show you how uh, queries work. Um, the first set is the demographic set, and we created some um, people that are patients with family relationships between them. So basically, we created um, this uh, family tree. These are many families in many generations with uh, names, the sex, and date of birth of different generations. And then re the re relationships between the child and a parent is a um, natural child coded with, with a SNOMED CT concept. This is the code in SNOMED CT for natural child. Yeah, And we will use this relationship to query, actually, family relationships with uh, SNOMED CT expressions. Yeah, I will show you that later. And the EHR setup or the clinical data setup is for each of those persons, um, we created one EHR and each EHR is uh, loaded with some compositions. There's one composition that is demographic and that just has an administrative entry with sex and date of birth because sex and date of birth, uh, even though those are demographic uh, data points are also clinically relevant because you know you need to know the sex of the patient or the, the, the age of the patient, yeah? So these are also loaded in the clinical side. We loaded also some compositions with vital signs. So this is blood pressure, pulse, uh, um, temperature, et cetera. 
Um, and we loaded also uh, an evaluation with a coded diagnosis. And this I will use to also show you how the querying for coded data using SNOMED CT expressions for diagnosis work. Yeah. And all the data in Atomic, I mentioned that before, um, is um, defined by an OpenHR operational template. That is just a big archetype that defines each data uh, data structure, like uh, all these compositions for the diagnosis, vital signs, a demographic, even the the EHR part of the EHR. It's called the EHR status. It's also defined by OPT, and also all the people that was was loaded. Um, there is an op operational template defining that structure, and also the relationships are defined by that. And the relationships, as I mentioned before, have just a coded type of relationship that is in this case, just natural child, but you can have many types of relationships that, that are not uh, family relationships. Like you can you can work, you can have a doctor that works in an organization, for instance, and that is another type of uh, relationship that we can load into the system. Yeah, so that's, that's the basic uh, setup. So the demographic support, um, we designed um, REST API, for demographics, because the current specifications uh, in OPHR don't have a REST API for demographic data. Um, the current REST API just has uh, access to the clinical side, that is EHR, contributions, compositions, versioned objects, etc. Yeah, but doesn't have a demographic um, API. And we implemented this following the current uh, structure of the um, other REST APIs already defined by OpenHR. And we proposed our API to be considered to be standardized in, in OpenHR. So I'm part of also of the group that um, manages the specifications. There is the standard editorial committee in OpenHR. So basically in that group, we decide what goes in the specifications, the formal specifications. And I proposed this um, design to that group. And uh, we also support the demographic reference model. That is everything in, in OpenHR that is defined as demographic model is supported by Atomic. That is all the actors, um, that is per person, organization, agent, group, and the party relationships that are ways to uh, associate uh, or define relationships between those um, entities. Um, also, the roles, we support, we support roles. Uh, there is a design decision that role will be in Atomic, a weak entity in, in relationship with uh, an actor. So basically, uh, roles can't be created uh, by themselves. When you create a person, for instance, uh, and you want to create a role for that person, you need to create the role when you're creating the person. Yeah. So, so if you want to say, this person is a doctor, this person is a nurse, this person is a patient, those are roles. You need to create the roles when you're creating the person. Yeah, but that, that's a, a small design decision to simplify implementation. And we also support other entities like identities, capabilities, contacts, addresses, etc. Yeah. And the other part that we support is querying. So we can query all this data uh, with the same mechanism we use to query um, clinical data. So compositions, for instance. Yeah. The challenge we had uh, for doing this work um, is that most modeling tools don't support demographic archetypes and operational templates. Um, so, or if they support, they support partially. So we needed to, for some of the archetypes and templates that we use, uh, we need to manually edit them. Yeah, so that's a challenge. Uh, I hope modeling tools uh, support more demographic um, uh, uh, archetypes and templates in the future and, and all these classes. Uh, but if not, I might need to create my own, you know, uh, archetype designer or template designer in the future. Yeah, but because this is important. So I will show you how this works and what demographic elements we have in Atomic. Uh, first, about the model, what I show you about the model. Uh, let me load these pages. Uh, while that is loading, I will log in to Atomic. What I show you about the support for reference model is basically these classes in the OpenHR specification. So we have here 
all the um, actors that are person, organization, group, agent, party relationships, roles, capabilities, contacts, addresses, identities, etc. That is what we support in Atomic. So in Atomic, what you can see when you log in, the first thing is a little dashboard. And here I added just a simple count of the people that we have loaded and the organizations. We don't have any organizations. Um, but this gives you just uh, an initial taste of what it what is loaded in the system. And these are demographic classes. Uh, if I go to uh, contributions, contributions is anything that changes in the system. That is, you can create um, a composition in an EHR, that's a contribution. You, you create an EHR, that's a contribution. You create a person, that's a contribution. So a contribution is co like a big log of things that changed in the system. So I can click on one contribution and I can see what is inside. In this contribution, I have the log information, the idea of the contribution, and I have all the versions of the objects that were added in that contribution. This contribution is actually for a relationship between two um, demographic classes and is just a generic relationship. So this is the template ID, the archetype ID. This tells you that this was created. So in OpenHR, you can create, you can modify, you can amend, or you can even delete these things yeah but this was a contribution that contained uh, data about the demographic relationship between two um, persons this is really one of those family relationships another thing you can see related to demographics is the version object for demographics right now we have uh, compositions we have folders hr statuses these are created when you create an hr and actors is any kind of actor i just have uh, people loaded. I don't have organizations or group or agents, but here you can see all the actors, the template that defines that actor, the root um, archetype ID of that actor. This is an OpenHR archetype. And if I click on one of those versioned objects, I can see the ID of that object and all the versions of that object. Because I just created uh, data, I don't have any versions more than the first one. Yeah. So if you you create a person and you modify the person here you will see the modifications all the logs for the modifications so you can go back in history and see everything that happened to one record that could be a, a person an organization a clinical document etc yeah another thing we can support for demographics as i said everything should have their own uh, open hr um, operational template yeah so in the template area we have a little uh, manager for templates you can upload new templates you can version templates etc you can see here we have a template for the person and if i click on the template uh, i can see the basic information about the template the versions for the template uh, atomic allows you to when you're developing uh, it is very useful to be able to load a template, then change it a little bit, then load it again. Uh, and we maintain all the versions for the same template. So you can upload the same template many times through the web uh, interface. So the web console allows that. The REST API doesn't allow that. So when you upload the same template twice, the, the second time it will tell you that's an error or um, it says uh, a conflict. Yeah, so from the REST API to be compliant with the OpenHR specifications, you can't upload the same archetype twice, uh, the same template twice. And here is just the template uh, uh, information. It's just the, it's the source template. Yeah, that defines a person in Atomic. And then what is really nice is you have the queries here. I already created some queries just to show you how those works. Uh, but I will create some queries live. So this is um how queries are created in uh, atomic and i will show you quickly how you to create some um different types of queries for demographic data uh the first thing is what you want to retrieve so in this case i will show you how to retrieve data values then um this is the query builder that I mentioned before, it shows you all the templates that are loaded in the system. And I will choose the template for the person. And when I click on that, it shows here all the archetypes that are inside that template. In this template, it's very simple. So I will click on this only archetype. And this box shows you the internal structure of that archetype. 
And you can see here, because it's, this is for a person, you can see that there is an identifier, there is a full name, there is a date of birth, sex, et cetera. And below you have like a home address, city, street, blah, blah, blah. So the common information about a person, yeah. And it also shows you the data type. So you can see the full name is a text. The date of birth is a date. Sex is a coded text, yeah. And I can just pick the data that I want out. So I will pick full name, uh, date of birth, and sex. And here it says, ah, from this archetype, take what is in this path. And that is the full name that is a text. The same with the date of birth, that is a date. The same with the text, that is a coded text. And here I will group the results by the person, and I will... I will test. I can create the query or test the query. If I create the query, this query will be stored in the system and will be accessible through the REST API. I will test and I will test live. So here I can um, execute, for instance, and you can see a lot of data coming out. Uh, and this is basically a structure that has this data inside. It's basically a table, yeah? with all the data that is in the system. So I wanted the, the name, the date of birth, and the sex that is coded. And you can see here the value for the name for one patient is Mauro. This is the date of birth. And for the sex that is a coded text, we have three values. We have the text value, the code value, and the terminology ID. In this case, terminology ID local means that the code is defined in the same archetype. Yeah, but we can use external terminologies too. That depend doesn't depend on atomic, depends on how the, the template is modeled and created. Yeah, but this is one way to get data out. And if I create, uh, as I said, this query will be in accessible through the web, um, the REST API, sorry. Uh, so you can get the same data through the REST API. Yeah, that is one way to query. I will just clean everything. I show you another type of query that I will query for actors. I want actors to be the result of the query. And this show me just the templates for actors. So I just have a person template. It shows me all the archetypes as before is the same archetype and the same structure, but now I can say, um, I want a condition defined over the name. It could be a condition defined over anything. On, is on every data point here that is bolded, could be uh, on any data point there. And for the full name, I, I have here a condition that is over the value of the full name and that the value is a text. Um, I can say uh, the comparison is equals to some value that I give here or contains like. Contains like will check any, for instance, if I add Rob, Mari, um, Bar, it will check if this value matches the full name partially. So it could be that I have a data that is Robert and Rob will match that. And that this will take um, in consideration all the values here, it will match this or this or this. Yeah, that's a simple query to, to test. So I added that um, criteria and the criteria is defined in that way over the archetype on that path that points to the full name that is a color text and the condition that will be uh, checked is that the value contains like one of these values. And I can test this. Uh, live and I can execute this and I get two results. This is the um, minimal result. But if we want the full result, we can change this to yes, retrieve data to yes. And I can execute again the same query and it will give me a person in the canonical JSON format of OpenHR. This is a, a OpenHR person. Yeah, and if we actually search for full name in the data, so I will search for full name here, you can see that we have one object here that is Barbara, and then the other one was here. The second result is Mariana. And if we check the, the query, the condition, we have 
Bar here that matches with Barbara and Mari here that matches with Mariana. Yeah. Um, we can do also more complex things like I want to query by the sex and the condition over the sex since this is a coded uh, text is different because I can define a condition over the code. And you can see here that the terminology ID is already loaded with local. This comes, this information comes from the template, the same as the value for the code. This information comes from the template. So I'm really querying using the information given by the template. Yeah. So if I want to query for mail, I will add this condition and I would want uh, the actor to match both of these. So I will um, match sex is male and the full name will match any of this. So I need to add an and of these conditions. And the result for this will be empty because both results uh, for the first condition were females. So if I test this, just to show you this works, the, the result is empty. Yeah, but if I change this to um, female, I will remove the and and will remove the sex condition and I will change the condition to female and I will add that again and this will be an and. This should give me uh, two results. Yeah, and this is the same results as, as before. And I can also say, ah, uh, this is a count. I marked, I clicked on this is count and I can execute again and I get the count instead of the uh, data. Yeah, so those are uh, two ways of querying um, data that could be, in this case, demographic. A third way, and I should I show you just some conditions here. We can also define like conditions over, this is just to show you, over the, the date of birth, we can use uh, age in years, for instance, and if we, check this condition and we say 18 years between, we can get, if I write this, we get people uh, that have uh, age between 30 and 60 years old. So that is very useful. And you can say, for instance, uh, instead of giving values, you can say, ah, oh, this is a variable. So when you define a variable there, and I will just show you how this works very, Fast. I will just remove the conditions one by one. And I will add this condition over the date of birth. You can see here when I say, ah, use variables instead of values, you can see here the age in years should be between and it generates two uh, variables. And the variables have meaningful names like date of birth, value, age in years, low, because it's a range and age in years, high. And if I test this, it will ask me to provide these values. If I don't provide the values, it will tell me, hey, these values are mandatory. So I can say, as before, 30 and 60, something like that. And I can query. And since I have the is count uh, checked, it returned the number of people I have loaded in the database between these ages. So that is a quick um, indicator. Yeah, this is a for loading like um, uh, uh, analytics or statistics uh, system. This is um, very easy to create. It's just point and click uh, and the ease count should be um, clicked. And if I want the data, I, ju I just click on that and I get all the data. If I don't want the data, just the references to the people, I can click on this and the records are really small. And you can use this ID to actually get the data from that person. Yeah, and I have the five results there. So those are types of um, queries that we can use for querying um, uh, demographic data, but also clinical data. And the last thing I want to show you about, um, I will clean everything up, about querying, and that involves is using SNOMED city expression is to query the relationships. I mentioned that I loaded relationships with a family uh, relationships, a relationship code on, on them. So I will just pick, I want family party relationships as the result. And this is um, the 
template for the relationship. This is the archetype. And here I can query by the type of relationship. And one interesting thing is I can query for the condition in SNOMED expression. This is uh, an operator that allows me to use SNOMED expressions. Yeah. And here I write the SNOMED expression. This SNOMED expression will be based on the family relationships. Oh, this didn't load. Oh. But will be this one. Will be this expression. I will just copy. Not sure why this is loading slow. Ah, I have here the blood relative uh, concept, and that includes um, the natural child uh, relation uh, relationship type that I mentioned before, and that is inside the blood relative, inside the first degree blood relative, and a descendant from this is natural child. But what happens if I query for this code? So I will use this expression, and this says I want any descendant of this concept in SNOMED uh, CT, and that concept is blood relative. This is just a comment in the um, in the SNOMED CT expression. In and if I check that, it will verify using our uh, SNOMED CT service internal service if that expression is valid or not. You can see the green box there. That means that expression is valid. If I write like something else, it will be red. Yeah. Um, one thing that we want to add in the future is a SNOMED CT expression builder right here. So you don't need to copy and paste the SNOMED expression. Yeah. So the condition is the same as before. It's an, a condition over um, an archetype path that is the relationship type that is coded. And it says the code should be in this SNOMED expression. And if I test this, let's test that, uh, execute. I get some results, yeah? And if I say retreat data, we can get the results in the uh, um, OpenHR format. Yeah, this is the canonical format. Uh, and if we search inside the structure, we can see here an element that is relationship type and has a value that is a coded text that is natural child. So my expression above matches this uh, code because this code is actually a descendant from this other code that is blood relative. So this is a way to use SNOMED expressions to filter data and to query uh, for data that we have in our database that is coded with its SNOMED, yeah? Um, one thing that uh, a comment about this is it will be very difficult to do this in a normal way of querying databases because in a normal way, you need to define all the codes in the query. And what happens if a code is added to SNOMED or removed from SNOMED or something changes, you need to modify all your queries. Uh, if you use expressions to define your, your queries, it's more secure that you don't need to actually touch the, the queries. Yeah, it could happen, but with less frequency than using all the codes. Yeah, and using all possible codes in some cases is very difficult because maybe for some, um, uh, SNOMED CT expressions, you have 200 codes, yeah? So this is another way of querying. And I can combine this um, um, blood relative with other uh, conditions. For instance, I, want, I can say the source of the relationship has this ID, for instance, and I will query for all the uh, blood relatives of that person, of that um, uh, person that has that, that ID, yeah? So those are ways of, of querying um, using uh, um, demographic, the demographic model. Yeah, so querying for demographics. So going back to the presentation, um, the idea that we have is for the demographic component of Atomic to provide all the basic systems to build other systems and applications on top of it. Yeah, um, we want, for, for instance, to be able to create an enterprise master patient index on top of the services that we provide on Atomic, the demographic services. Also, healthcare um, provider directories, also uh, in, in the, um, to have everything uh, loaded and managed by Atomic, but in, you can, on top of that, create more services and systems. And the idea is that uh, 
by implementing those using a standard model like OpenHR allows data consistency, standardization, standardization and neutrality of the information. So we don't need to deal with information that comes in different structures, uh, from different systems in different formats, etc., maybe complying with different rules. So we might end with inconsistent information, even though the information is for doctors or patients or organizations, etc. So this allows you know uh, to create higher level um, uh, services on top of it, um, without all the inconsistency, fragmentation, and all the data quality issues that we might have if we do all these systems in a separated way and isolated way, and then we need to um, integrate them. So that's the idea, so that's the vision. The next, ne next things that we will add is, for instance, to detect, automatically detect um, duplicates in um, patients, for instance. That, that's a problem many hospitals and networks of hospitals have. Uh, that have the same patient many times in their databases. And sometimes they have also EHRs created for those patients that are really the same patient. And that creates uh, data fragmentation in the EHR. So we want to run continuous uh, tests for duplicated information and to provide a user with a report for the potential duplicates. And the user can decide if those um, patients, for instance, are really duplicates or not. And if those are duplicates, we can merge or link the, the patients. And we can also merge or link the EHRs. So we can, with that, reduce the data fragmentation. Um, we are also uh, thinking about uh, supporting IHE profiles that are related with uh, demographic information. That is if the client needs that. If the client um, doesn't implement any profiles, that's not needed. Um, we also want, and this is a mid-term objective uh, goal, uh, we want to mix demographic queries with EHR queries. The idea is this. We want to query uh, family groups and also check if there is some ancestor on that family group that has certain um, you know, disease, chronic disease, or uh, some disease that could be inherited. And create uh, reports or alerts to feed a clinical decision support systems with those risk factors. So we can proactively check for potential um, diseases that are not yet um, diagnosed. And we can say a doctor, oh, look, the grandparent of this patient had, um, I don't know, intestinal cancer. So double check and the and the person is is older than uh, 40 years old. So this patient needs a colonoscopy. For instance, I'm not a clinician, so clinicians might be laughing right now. <laughs> but we can do that pro proactively. We can uh, with the data we have and the services we have, we can we can actually do that very easily. Yeah, and that could lead to early detection of these diseases that might be mortal for the patient. Really, so that's powerful and that's an objective that, that we have yeah so with that i will take a breath and drink a little water um i ended with the demographic support please if you have any questions about that i will just have a drink of water give me one second uh, i will show you how uh, more about data queries and snowman expressions since i i show you uh, uh, three or four queries i will go very fast over this section Ah, good. It's good to drink some water. So about data queries in Atomic, um, all queries are stored. That means that you create a query uh, using the query builder that I just showed you, and these queries are stored in the system. When a query is stored in the system and it is created, as I, as I show you, every query is created in the same way. It's just pointing, clicking, and adding things. Um, it creates a new data service. So every query that you create is available through the REST API and other systems and applications can uh, discover those uh, queries by the name, by the description. I even did uh, a little um, exercise feeding a query to chat, uh, chat GPT. And ChatGPT was able to describe that query, what that query does. So if we have those descriptions, 
uh, and are very complete descriptions um, uh, alongside with the queries, um, an external um, a client of Atomic can discover those queries and reuse queries that already exist. Yeah, and some administrator can create queries that don't exist. Yeah, so when you are creating queries, you're creating really a data service, a data extraction service. Um, and I just show you that we support uh, variables with, with meaningful names, and the names also come from the template information. So when you see a variable that is systolic blood pressure value, you know exactly what it, it is, yeah? Uh, but if I show you like cyst one two three, you don't know about about that. So um, we created uh, meaningful names for variables, and that's a way to reuse the same query um, if you need to change, for instance, the ranges. Uh, so a client can can change the ranges using variables, and the variables are included in the um, in the queries. So when you when you list the queries available in the in Atomic through the REST API, you get also the variables that that query uh, uses and you need uh, the, query, the values that you need to provide. And if you don't provide the values for the variables, the result of executing the query will tell you, ah, you need to provide a variable, a, a value for this variable, yeah? Um, we also support the snowman expressions. I just show you how that works um, as semantic filters for coded data. And we support date, date functions. I, I show you that with the age in years. We support uh, complex operators like content like. I also show that for query uh, the patient name, etc. And these are some uh, examples of very simple SNOMED expressions. And you can build more complex SNOMED expressions. But these SNOMED expressions work with the data that I have loaded. Also, the data I loaded to show you how this works is very simple. So I, I didn't want to make any any anything that is too complex to, to understand and is easy to follow up. For instance, the first um, uh, SNOMED expression, I already used that to query for uh, party relationships. Yeah, that is the blood relative. The second one is uh, give me EHRs with uh, any type of diabetes recorded on, on the EHR. So uh, this is the code for diabetes mellitus, the top code. And this uh, queries for any descendant of that uh, concept in SNOMED. Um, we can use the same thing, but excluding part of the codes. So these uh, SNOMED expressions for people that are is not um, familiar with SNOMED is really querying the SNOMED concept graph. It's not a tree, it's a graph. And it's giving you a, a part of that graph. Yeah. Um, and so in this case, it's giving me all the types of diabetes mellitus, but it's leaving out, it's removing the diabetes that is secondary, any type of secondary diabetes. So this will be only primary diabetes, yeah? And we can use that to query and filter um, patients and find EHRs of patients that actually contain um, diagnosis that is some type of diabetes that is not a secondary type of diabetes. Also, we can use the fourth one to get, you know, any um, patients that have some kind of allergy. This is some kind of allergy. It's not specific type. You can have allergies to medications, allergies uh, to um, food, etc. Those codes are also in uh, SNOMED CT, those concepts. Yeah, but uh, this is just a very simple, uh, give me if the patient is allergic to something. Yeah, um, I will show you how this works with clinical data. Yeah, so let's query, let's create some queries for clinical data. Let's go back to the query builder. Uh, I can enter the, a name, I want to enter a name. Uh, I will query for compositions. I want clinical documents out of this. So I want, for instance, in this case, um, I will choose this template that has the coded diagnosis in it. Here you can see the structure of the archetypes inside the template. I will choose the archetype that is the observation, the evaluation for the problem and diagnosis. And here I have a node. These are all the nodes inside that template. I have a node that is the problem diagnosis name that is a coded text. I want this one. And here is the same as querying the relationship type. I will choose the code should be in 
SNOMED CT expression. I have the same here. I can validate the expression. This is invalid. And I will copy and paste an expression that I already have um, created. It's the same as the one in, in the presentation. Here is any type of diabetes mellitus without the secondary diabetes. Let's check if this is valid. It's valid, it's green. I can create that. And if I test this, I will. I can test this using a filter by EHR, but this will be a population uh, query. So I will query by all EHRs. Yeah, and I will say, don't retrieve data for this one. And here I get that result. This is the summary result. And this structure, what it does is it gives me the ID of the EHR and then all the clinical documents, these are open EHR compositions that contain a data point that matches my criteria. That is any type of diabetes without the secondary diabetes. Yeah, so this is actually a clinical document that contains that diagnosis. Yeah, and I have here the ID of that um, document and I have many EHRs. Yeah, um, if I, I want the data, actually the clinical document to be retrieved, I can say re retrieve data, yes. Here I get an open EHR composition in the JSON canonical format. And if we search, let's just for fun, verify this. Um, uh, this will be a problem, diagnosis problem. Let's search for this in the data. Here we have in the, in the result, problem diagnosis, the evaluation, and we have here the problem diagnosis name. And you can see this is insulin treated uh, type dose diabetes mellitus. And the code is this. And I didn't use this code. I use a, um, a SNOMED CT expression that actually contains this code. Yeah. And if I search for this problem diagnosis name below in other records in the result, I can say uh, diabetes mellitus, we can see this one without retinopathy. And also this is not part of my SNOMED CT expression, but is defined by it. We can see other types. You get the idea, yeah? So any any code that actually descends and, and matches any um, code that is defined by my SNOMED CT expression, I can get that, yeah? And I can define also more complex uh, conditions like uh, we can get, for instance, uh, the severity. In the, in the same archetype of, of problem diagnosis, we have severity. And here we have severity is a coded text and could be equals to, and these values of mild, moderate, severe come from the template. Yeah. So if I add mild, I have added here the condition for the severity mild, and I want both. I want that matches these um, diabetes without the secondary diabetes and matches that the uh, severity is mild. Yeah, and if I search again, here we have some results. Yeah, and if we look for severity here, severity in the results, we can see that the severity is mild. And for all the documents in the output should be, should be mild. Yeah, and this is the internal code defining mild. Yeah, so that is one way of querying for um, diagnosis using SNOMED CT expressions. Yeah, the, the, the queries for allergies and for other things is the same. Yeah, I won't do that. One thing that I want to show you also um, before I go to the next topic is that if we query, for instance, data values for um, vital signs, and we can see that we have blood pressure. So I will add to the query blood pressure, systolic, diastolic. Uh, I will add um, heartbeat rates and also, let's say, respiration rates. And I query for this uh, group by path. 
that means that all, all the values will be grouped by the type of value. So all systolic values will be here. All diastolic will be here. So in the same series, I can test this. And for this, I will filter by EHR. And we can see here a result. And if I had the data, this data is basically this that I'm showing here. Yeah. So it's very easy with one query. And I just show you with three clicks, yeah, um, or four, uh, to get data to be able to create these things. And Atomic, when you query for numeric data, automatically creates a chart for you. If you create numeric data and you create a um, series based on the, on the type of data. So for instance, you can see this is the systolic blood pressure. The, this should be heart rate or respiration rate. I don't know. There are two rates, the stolic and other rate here. Yeah. Um, all the names come from the templates and this is the values that you get. And so this is just a test. This is to validate that the data that you get out of the system uh, is, con is makes sense. Yeah. But you can create these things outside in client systems. You get the information and you can chart the, them very quickly. Uh, so it's, it's very easy to create queries and actually um, do things with them. Yeah. And about queries, one extra thing that I want to show you. Yeah, is um, something that is called combined queries. So in Atomic, you can create these simple queries um, one by one, and you can create queries to say, ah, I want all the patients that have any type of diabetes, the one that I just show you. Uh, I want the patients that are male. I want the patients that have um, 30, between 30 and 70 years old. We can do that. And then we can mix those together to filter full EHRs. So you can get a patient that is diabetic, that is male, and the age is between this. And this allows you to create simple statistics. So you can mix uh, clinical data with demographic data. And you can add, instead of just diabetic, you can add more uh, comorbidities or risk factors, like you can create for obesity, you can create for high blood pressure, diabetes, cholesterol, all at the same time. And if you have a patient that matches that criteria, you will find a patient with risk for you know, heart disease, for instance. And this could take like 10 seconds to create and could be uh, a useful resource for sending uh, also reports and notifications to clinical decision support systems. So doctors, when they see the patient and they see they have, the, they are marked with this kind of label that says uh, this patient is high risk on for heart disease, they can take action. Yeah, they can, you know, uh, enroll them on a program to control their, you know, diabetes, cholesterol, whatever, obesity, yeah, or high, high blood pressure, and to prevent any any problems, yeah, in the future. So I will show you how that works, and it will just take two seconds. As I said, I already have this is like a cooking program on the TV. You already have something done, yeah. Uh, so I have a query that just queries for male patients, another query that queries just for female patients. So it filters by that. And I have queries just um, for age ranges. And I have other queries for uh, any type of diabetes is like the one that we created um, a second ago. Any type of that, sorry? Uh, we were just uh, thinking uh, it's... Uh... 10 minutes left of the first yep, hour. This will be very, very fast. If we should take some, some questions and then perhaps some people has to leave and then we can continue. Or, or, uh, this will but take, you can finish this example. Yeah, 20 seconds. We, we'll yeah. take just that. Uh, this is, are the basic queries that I have created. Yeah, And you can execute them uh, individually and you can access them through the REST API. But if you go to the uh, combined queries, I can actually say, uh, I want EHRs. Yeah, for male patients, 
that have the age between, for instance, 30 and 70 and have any type of secondary diabetes. And I can say, use this just to filter EHRs. Yeah, I won't create one, but it takes just two seconds to create one. And I have already created here some uh, combined queries. So here I have female patients, any type of allergy, and this uses a SNOMED CT expression inside and age between that range. And if I execute, it will run these three queries over all the EHRs in the database. And if there is um, a result for each of these queries, it will display the EHR ID here. So I found two EHRs for female that have any type of allergy and age between this. And we can very easily count them. So we, we have with this um, a very basic statistics uh, system, really. And also these queries could be executed through the REST API once created yeah, and takes nothing to create. Yeah. So with this, um, I just finished the, this part and we will start with conformance verification. Yeah. We can go through some quer some okay, so, questions. So we, yeah, we we'll take some questions first. I think. Uh, do you want me to read them out? Uh, I can. I can do I can that. Open for... the chat here. Uh, yeah. So sorry, the first the question chat. is about the long-term plans for your company and and the product. Uh, some regions are a bit curious about the size of the company, and wonder about long-term support risks. And then it says, it's, it's a small but wonderful, is it a small but wonderful one-man show? Uh, yes and no. Yeah. So I've been working just with OpenHR for, for the last 17 years. So uh, my, and I've been doing that first as a normal employee on some companies. And then uh, from 2011, I've been working just in, in, in my company. Uh, this is a small company, right? Right now we have a couple of developers and me. Um, we are focused mainly on services, yeah, right now, on services and education, yeah? And in the last, I would say, four years, three, four years, um, we wanted to also provide product, yeah? And Atomic is one of those products. We also have... Um, this other product that is the OpenHR toolkit. So I, I, maybe you don't know this, but this is just a set of tools that you can sign up uh, online and you can use for uh, working with OpenHR uh, data and templates, etc. So we are not going anywhere. Uh, we are here to stay and grow. Uh, and we are developing more tools, uh, and and that's it. Looking for projects and looking for uh, you know tenders, etc. So that is why we are here. Uh, I, I I won't I I won't waste your time on you know something that I won't go to the, on, in the long run. We are small, yeah, but that doesn't mean that we are not going for the long run. That's good. Are mm -hmm. there any plans to support AQL later? I don't know. No, did uh, you say what your, your mm -hmm. query, query language, does it have a name? Maybe you said it, but... Yeah, it, you in fact, it has a, Yeah, it is. Uh, I have a... Uh, it's this. It's simple archetype model language. Um, I, I A couple of years ago, I reviewed the... I was working on the on the OpenHR standards and did a full review of the AQL uh, specification. The problem with AQL, even though it's a it's a general purpose um, querying language in OpenHR, uh, the specification uh, relies too much on the syntax, and uh, the specification doesn't have an internal definition on what are the processes, the technical processes to actually ex uh, implement. It. So if you run different, uh, the same AQL query in two OpenHR implementations, you might get different results. Um, another thing is uh, uh, supporting a general purpose uh, query language uh, is very complex. So my te technical design decision was to make um, a good enough uh, 
query model, not relying on, on the syntax, but to create a model that you can use any syntax really to represent it. Uh, but it's not focused on the syntax, it's focused on um, the process of executing the query in a, in a given uh, database structure. Yeah, because it's, it's basically translating the, the query, the, what the user sees, uh, to an internal SQL uh, query. Pablo, I think you have explained this very well in the written response, exactly what you're saying. Now, I think the uh, question yeah. is rather, do you plan to implement APL or not just the, the short, like, you no know, or yes? Uh, yeah. In the short term, no. Uh, in the long term, because as I said, this is a, comp a very complex thing. And currently our query model could be mapped to a subset of AQL because AQL is general purpose. And, and we are like a, um, a domain specific language. It would, yeah. if you, yeah. So, so uh, short term, no long short term, term, no, but in the long term, uh, we will need like, like a project to be able to uh, support AQL. And we like, can also implement, uh, you know, that the subset of AQL that is maps one-to-one -to, -one to our model. So that could be done very easily. Thank you. Next question yeah. then. Uh, how tested is the scalability of the solution in practice? The theoretical written response looks reasonable. Have you done load testing? Is there a large customer installation? Yeah, okay. no. This is this is something that we are actually currently releasing. Yeah. Uh, so we are talking with um, um, a, a client in Spain and a client in India. To actually implement this, uh, the client in Spain has uh, 15 clinics, um, and the client in India has a couple of hospitals. So we didn't test this uh, uh, in high scale. Um, the the way this this will work is you will create several uh, instances of the server, and right now the the response time is not so good because it, this is running on my local machine. And I have a small machine, so you click on something and you need to wait a couple of seconds. This is not the response time you will get on a production server. Um, but it will work in, in that way. You will create several instances. You will put a load balancer. It's the same as, as anything. And then it, you will replicate the data between the servers, the instances. And so you distribute the load. That's the idea, and also you can use um, caching. I, I think I, I I answered that on the on the form um, to use uh, caching for uh, preventing long running queries uh, to block the client. So the idea is if if this is used for supporting a primary um, uh, care practice, for instance, and tomorrow you you have coordinated um, uh, consultations. You can execute all the queries that you need to feed uh, the, you know, the, the patient uh, dashboard and some basic data like the last vital signs, the last laboratory results, imaginology reports, uh, medications that the patient took, etc. Um, the day before, you can cache that and you can access like in in, in yeah, order yeah, one. Pablo, I think the question day. was just if it hasn't been tested. The, the theoretical things you've already explained very well, so it has the possibility to scale probably. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But that—that that is how I will implement uh, scale. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the question was only about if it was tested in practice. The theory looked good, so we don't need to take the theory again. Oh, okay. And uh, just a short follow-up on question number one uh, on the size of the company. How many full-time equivalents uh, are there employed? You mentioned a couple of uh, programmers. We are three right now. Three full-time. Yep. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but uh, the the for the, the let's say thinking in your context, we are in contact with um with companies in Sweden. Like we we have um, um Cambio there that we are collaborating collaborating in um in the conformance part currently. So uh, if you are worried about local support, we we have contacts there that could help in that area so it's not just really it, it's not that it will rely on us that we are on the other part of the world yeah we we will be 
Uh, in practice, we will be the second level of support. The first level will be on site. Oh. Then we have a fourth uh, question sure. before we can turn to the last uh, part of this meeting. Then um, it's about if you support a back. Do you say that, or how how is it pronounced? <laughs> Attribute based access control, and if so, what sources can be used for the attributes to be evaluated in ABAC? Yeah, right now we don't we don't support attribute based. Uh, we can we can support uh, because because of this. Uh, this is not um, this is a platform system, so anything that is used to um, to to actually use the system in uh, the context of our organization and implementing organizational rules should be on top of this. Yeah. So the filters of, of for accessing specific information should be on top. And Eric, it's not it's not the scope of, of Atomic to provide those specific rules. Thanks. And there's a yeah. comment on this uh, question number four, and I ask Eric directly if you could. Yes, uh, the way we had formulated uh, some of our questions regarding uh, the access rights and things were a bit difficult to understand. We understood it if you were not in the Swedish context, so so that's why we reformulated it now to. That's uh, okay. That's okay. Support. So, just sorry about that, but I think uh, that was a good response. We'll put that on another layer if we're interested in it. Well, I think there are no more questions right now in the chat. So I. Uh, the first hour is um, for, for now, so uh, please stay if you can to the audience and we continue. Yeah, for the conformance part, yeah, yeah if you are interested in that. Yeah, so just continue. Perfect. Let me switch again to the presentation. I think it's this screen. Um, and a bit of the question there is what kind of services you can provide to help us with conformance testing and things like that. A lot of services, Eric. Very nice. <laughs> so conformance, ah, this is a big area. Um, so the first thing I need to clarify, this is not just running a set of tests against a system. It's, it's more complex uh, than that. Um, this needs a framework, and this needs to define uh, what should be tested, for which types of systems, and how this should be defined in that, uh, that framework. Um, also, the expected outputs, that is uh, for, the, for the individual tests, for the compliance levels, if we define compliance levels, different scores, etc. We need also to give guidance uh, to stakeholders, that is, for buyers, they need to know what to expect and to ask to vendors. Vendors need to know what to execute, what to provide, et cetera, what uh, processes to follow, yeah, what documents to create. So, and for also for evaluators that sit in the middle, uh, independent evaluators that will, for instance, verify conformance of a system from a vendor when a buyer wants to buy that system. Yeah. Uh, if we don't have a guidance, we can't define clear rules for you know, this environment. Uh, we need to define all the processes, resources that are used for testing conformance, um, all the test cases and terminology that we use, and any other resource that is used up for this should be really defined uh, in detail. Yeah. And we also need, this is very important, we also need to consider some design and technical implementation decisions because that uh, at certain system doesn't pass a test doesn't mean the system is not compliant with OpenHR. That means that they might implemented some feature or some part of the specification based on an interpretation they did of the specifications. And if we as uh, evaluators, let's say, I, I, I put myself on the vendor side, but also on, on the evaluator side, um, interpreted that part of the specification in a different way, we are creating tests for the, our interpretation. And maybe uh, there is no right interpretation, but both interpretations are right. So we need to consider the technical decisions that each implementation does, not just take the output of the automatic test and say, ah, this didn't pass, this did pass, and that's it. 
That is why it is not just running tests against, against the system. Yeah, that is the only way we can, with all this framework and elements, we can define um, fair rules for everyone, for all implementers. Yeah, and also the buyers know what to expect from this. Um, so what is done currently? Yeah, um, we have, I have published uh, an OpenHR conformance verification framework. It's the second draft right now. This came from a work I did um, for the last, I think it was four, three, four years working in Heimet. That was, uh, it, it is a German project. Um, and I worked that uh, in, in that project from 2018 until last year. Um, and part of my work, important part of my work was verifying conformance of the CDR they choose to implement. And I took that work and I formalized that into a document that is the conformance verification framework and extended the scope of uh, for testing any type of um, OpenHR implementation, not just uh, clinical data repositories. Yeah. So that is a document that we we have, and I can give you the link so you can review it. And any you know comments are uh, welcome. Um, then we have the test suite designs, and this is just the designs for all the tests that will be implemented uh, and run automatically against an implementation. So this is just um, spec, and I have created those when I was working for the German project, and those are very well documented. After the German project, I, I um, improved them. I added some test cases, data sets, et cetera. So that includes the test case definitions for each component of OpenHR and data sets for testing. This is data sets that are inputs and outputs. So expected uh, outputs for certain inputs. And this includes templates, compositions, et cetera. Yeah. Um, we also have an automated test implementation of those specifications. Uh, the current implementation is, was done in, in Python and was done during the, the, my work on, on the German project. And uh, Python is not a very um, usual language, I would say, in, in our space. And it, it was very difficult to maintain, really. It, it started small, it looked very nice, but when tests uh, got more complex and we had a lot of tests, uh, it was a mess to maintain. So we are currently migrating this to a Java framework and we are using Spock framework. And for this work, we are working together with Cambio because they want to uh, have this implementation also to test their systems. So it's nice that we have two you know, companies collaborating on, on, on this. Um, and one note, about this is that the current uh, OpenHR specification for conformance is based on the test suites I designed uh, for the German project. Uh, but the current conformance specification, first is a draft, uh, second uh, has a narrow scope than the conformance verification framework. It's focused on just clinical data repositories, not focused on, for instance, demographic data repositories, um, uh, clinical modeling tools, like for creating archetypes, templates, uh, processes, et cetera, or, or, or rules for clinical decision support, or uh, CKMs, clinical knowledge managers, yeah? And other types of systems that you can build on top of the OpenHR specifications or implementing OpenHR specifications. This link here, and I will send you the presentation afterwards. Uh, so you have this, uh, this is, explains a little bit of this and has a link to the document, yeah? For the conformance verification framework. And that document tries to, to define uh, all the things that I mentioned before, all the things, what should be, tested the expected outputs and inputs, the guides, uh, processes, et cetera. Every, everything is in that uh, document, yeah? It's a long document. I, I like writing documents. <laughs> I don't like reading them. Um, and our goals for this, all this work, and that is ongoing work. Um, first, we want to be able to verify any kind of system uh, that implements OpenHR for, from any vendor in an unbiased and transparent way. So even though I provide systems in, in, the, in the OpenHR, I would say environment, uh, world, domain, um, if, I, if a vendor contacts me and says, hey, Pablo, uh, 
can you validate this our tool verifies with the open chart specifications i will do that uh in an unbiased and transparent way because i already have processes defined for me to not be biased so i will follow those processes and my client knows that i will follow those processes yeah because they know i will follow them because it are defined processes in the framework yeah um so the idea is also to be able to compare systems of the same kind so cdr from vendor one with cdr from vendor two uh, uh, demographic data, uh, data repository from vendor one to the vendor two, etc. If you have different CKNs, if we have different modeling tools to compare them, yeah. And with that, we will compare, for instance, uh, conformance statements, uh, automated test results, and conformance verification reports. This is uh, the interpretation from an evaluator of the automated test results. As I said, we need to consider certain design decisions to not just the results and also the conformance statement. The conformance statement, that is something that we don't do in the OpenHR world. A lot, a lot of times uh, for a lot of vendors, I didn't see one conformance statement. Um, it's very common in the imaginology world when you work with DICOM and you work with, um, you know, uh, different um, software vendors, different um, um, devices like uh, tomography, X-ray, uh, ultrasound, etc. All of them are, are compatible with DICOM. And when you buy them, the vendor uh, gives you a conformance statement that says how this device, software system or tool implements DICOM in which way. And so that's the conformance statement. It's just saying, I implement this in this way. And the conformance statement should be part of any contract. So it's very nice to have one because when you buy something and the vendor says, ah, yeah, I comply with everything. And then you buy and you start using the system and you realize it doesn't comply with anything, with everything, you have the conformance statement to cancel the contract if you want. Yeah, so that's very important. And any buyer should ask for this. Yeah, but also if every vendor creates this, there is no standard way to create this. There is standard structure. So the idea is to be able to compare them. So in the conformance verification framework, we have a definition of each data point, each structure that should be defined in the conformance statement. So it's basically the questions that a vendor should answer. Yeah, so a buyer could buy, you know, uh, with more security. Yeah, not just trusting the, the vendor. Uh, and this, the idea is to prepare all stakeholders to run conformance uh, verification processes, vendors, buyers, and evaluators. Um, we also want this to be adopted by OpenHR. This will be will take some time, but the idea is to have official certification from OpenHR um, to be able to verify any kind of system. Yeah, and. What we want to do next is to finish the migration of the test implementations to a Java technology. I mentioned that. Um, to contact vendors to have those uh, initial tests to be to run on their systems, not to run the verification, um, uh, the conformance verification process on their systems, just to run the test to see if we can run from three or four different vendors at least on their CDRs or whatever type of system they provide to actually validate the conformance verification framework works. Yeah, so we need a little back and forth. Is, is this the last slide or because we are running yep. out of time? Yep, yeah, it's just the last slide. Ah, okay, then shoot. Yeah, yeah. Um, we also need to formalize the current uh, conformance uh, specification in OpenHR because it's a draft right now. And um, we want to create a program for pro for certification, software certification in OpenHR. Like we have the the uh, clinical modeling program, we have the education program, we have the specification program. We might have a, a certification program too. And we want to become evaluators to help buyers and vendors to follow these processes. Yeah, and also to execute uh, in in our own tools. Yeah, and that's it. That's my last slide. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Ah. So I think there are no new questions right now in the chat. Maybe they are coming. Someone? Yeah, if you have any questions, just let me know. Yeah. 
it's late Friday afternoon in Sweden, so <laughs> mm. <laughs> tired, but <laughs> that's okay. You can ask me anything if you want. Yeah. And if uh, our brains are too tired right now, is it okay to come back with questions after this meeting? Yeah, of course. You have my email. Yeah, that's great. Um, it doesn't seem to be any more questions right now and i agree with eric in the chat a very nice presentation thank you <laughs> thank you yeah thank you um, for so the extra I, time <laughs> <laughs> so i think we can stop the recording then and